Good evening, welcome to Brass Tax and Zaka Jacob. Yesterday's ghastly attack at the Kabul airport may have laid bare a very old but a very deeply divisive fault line. The turf war between the ISIS Khorasan, a group which has now claimed responsibility for the attack, and the Taliban, who are now the new rulers of Afghanistan. This, ladies and gentlemen, and let's make no mistake about this, this turf war between the ISIS-K and the Taliban is going to define the immediate future of Afghanistan. And in that immediate future, a future in which a lot of blood will be spilled, is there a way for Joseph R. Biden to salvage his presidency from the biggest botch-up that this exit plan has become? Some are even comparing this to the botch-up in Vietnam. Does America need to share as much, if not more, of the blame for what is happening in Afghanistan and what is likely to happen in the immediate future. Devastation in Kabul. Two deadly attacks outside the gates of the airport. Dozens of Afghans were killed, along with multiple U.S. service members. Their legacy will be the thousands of Afghans, little girls and little boys, who are alive today. Massachusetts Representative Seth Moulton saw the evacuation efforts firsthand during his widely criticized trip to Kabul this week. It was, it was actually, it was absolutely extraordinary. And the evacuations continue, a desperate race against time. ISIS-K has claimed responsibility for the attacks and the Department of Defense says more attacks are imminent. That could mean everything from rocket attacks to suicide bombings, either by car bomb or vest, like what happened Thursday. U.S. officials say they're hunting down the attackers at the same time they're trying to prevent more attacks, even turning to the Taliban for help and sharing intelligence. We cut down the information we give the Taliban. They don't get the full range of information we have, but we give them enough to act in time and space to try to prevent these attacks. And we believe that some attacks have been thwarted by them. But there's no plan right now for additional U.S. troops. And the August 31st deadline for troops to leave remains. And just getting a piece of breaking news, U.S. President Joe Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris have held a meeting with national security officials in the Situation Room of the White House. The meeting was attended by the Chairman of Joint Chiefs, uh, General Mark Miley, uh, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, the Director of National Intelligence, Averill Haynes and the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, among others of the national security team, uh, were given to understand that there was only one suicide bombing yesterday uh, and no second suicide bomber at the Baron Hotel. Uh, meanwhile, the Turkish president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, has also said that the Taliban has made them an offer to run the Kabul airport. But the Turkish government is yet to take a decision. Let me go across to our foreign affairs editor, Maha Siddiqui, who has more details on this. Uh, so the options really before Joe Biden and, and the U.S. government are rather limited. How do they plan to go about, you know, avenging what happened uh, at the Kabul airport, including the loss of 13 American uh, soldiers? So from what I understand, Zaka, and I've been speaking to a few experts who believe that uh, uh, this entire uh, statement given by Joe Biden that they're going to go after ISIS-K is something that at the moment uh, is is something which Joe Biden and the U.S. administration are going to find difficult, especially because they are moving all their troops out of the region. But they will perhaps be depending then on the Taliban itself. Because if you have seen some of the statements, Zaka, uh, the U.S. administration is delinking Taliban from ISIS-K very clearly. In fact, they have pointed out that ISIS-K is a sworn enemy of the Taliban and that they are utilizing this chaos on the ground, this uncertainty on the ground to create, uh, to kill as many people, conduct a carnage, because that's the nature of ISIS. Uh, they always target areas where they can inflict much more injury, and that is why they chose this space outside the Kabul airport, which is chock-a-block. I have spoken to a few people who returned from uh, Kabul as well uh, through evacuation, and they have been there. They say that the situation is absolutely chaotic. They've also explained that there are three layers of 
so called security in kabul at the moment the outer ring is manned by the taliban then comes the remnants of the afghan national army and finally the american forces starting off from the gate of the airport so basically the security from the gate onwards is with the us troops and it was here that the blast took place at the suicide bombing because of which we have seen casualties in the the injuries rather in the us right. forces as well uh going after isis k once your troops are out whether there will be intelligence sharing uh, at some stage with taliban because there is concern now that this could become a terror hotbed and even though uh, america believes that they the terror outfits in afghanistan will not have the potential to target america like they did uh, in 911 but now with this new emerging threat clearly uh, new formations will have to be looked at as far as uh, you know quelling this terror threat is concerned all right maha we leave it at that thanks very much maha siddiqui our foreign affairs editor there with details of this meeting that's happening at the white house right now uh let's now open this up to our panelists this evening ravi agarwal is the editor in chief of foreign policy uh vivek kaju former secretary in the ministry of external affairs hanif sufi zada is joining us from the center for afghanistan studies at the university of nebraska omaha uh, and dr wail awad is a senior international journalist and a west asia expert thanks very much uh gentlemen for speaking with us ravi i'll start with you uh you know up until yesterday up until the airport attack there was still the possibility that the biden white house could say you know this is a story that's 20 years old most americans want our troops back and we can extricate ourselves with a sense of you know relief that finally 20 years down the line this war is getting over but after yesterday's attack after 13 american lives have been lost is there some way for the white house to salvage what has clearly been a pretty botched up exit strategy I don't know. I think the jury's out on that. I think look, uh, if you take the wider span of history as you just did before American lives were lost, uh, I think there was a consensus here and especially within the Biden administration that they could ride it out. that they would be able to say that the american people are on their side that there's a real trend in the united states against so-called forever wars a tiredness against american involvement in arenas around the world that remains the case uh, we many of us uh, sort of assessing uh, the, the response here were we're imagining that if us lives were to be lost that equation changes and i think it did a little bit yesterday but i think here again uh, you know biden was able to frame uh, yesterday in his speech where he displayed real empathy he cried it was clear that when he said that he was grieving he was grieving uh, a real difference between him and his predecessor president trump for example but he also did say that you know the buck stops with him he took responsibility uh this was botched it could have been handled better uh i think a lot will depend as well on how the republicans are able to spin this over the next couple of years there's some talk already that they might try to make this uh you know biden's benghazi moment uh, as yeah. it were over the next couple of years and we'll hear a lot more of that so the jury is very much out but you know in the here and now um this is a body blow um for the biden administration um it's its first big foreign policy crisis um and they botched part of it and and they need to own up to that uh hanif zufizada here's the problem though when when mr biden says uh you know we we will not forgive we will not forget we will go after every one of the perpetrators who did this at the kabul airport here's the problem how how can america do this when they will have after the 31st of august a very negligible military presence if not next to nothing and, and even less so uh intelligence assets on the ground in afghanistan so even if they would get intel about a potential attack like they did with yesterday's attack what do they do with that information they can't pass it on to the taliban the taliban are not exactly known for you know counter terrorism and counter intelligence operations so in a sense you're going after people with your hands tied behind your back well that's true you know uh i mean uh, first uh uh we we need to understand that this should have been a, in a better way this uh it was the united states obligation to provide adequate force to execute a mission and protect uh troops carrying it out you know especially in the in the airport because there was carnage uh in afghanistan and kabul airport and many people were killed over 100 people in kabul were only killed and of course 30 uh, american marines were killed 
means that the uh, United States is uh, going out, but the crisis will remain in Afghanistan. So how they will resolve it is, is at the hands of Afghans right now. So I don't think so how the United States is going to help. It is a very strategic uh, uh, situation. They will understand how to do it. But uh, for us, for Afghans, it's our lives which matters. We don't want another war to start in Afghanistan and the people are being killed for just nothing. Uh, so this is uh, what is the concern of Afghanistan. That is what I am going to relate to you guys here. Uh, we are not concerned about anything else rather than our own lives right now because we don't have a, a, gov a functioning government right now. Everything, is, everything has collapsed for the last 20 years. The Afghans and the, and the international community, and of course, India helped Afghanistan stand on its own feet. It collapsed in a, within, the, within 11 days. So that's not what we wanted to see. We want international backing in Afghanistan. We want the issue of Afghanistan to be raised in the International Security Council. This is something that matters our lives, and we don't want to be left high and dry, whether the U.S. is leaving, the India is leaving, or okay. the NATO is leaving, but we want to be saved in one way or the other. Yeah, and I dare say, you know, that's going to be the, the reality, at least for the immediate future in Afghanistan. Uh, Vivek Aju, if indeed this is, you know, going to be a turf war between ISIS, Khorasan on the one hand, and the Taliban on the other, uh, you know, inherently, yes, if, if you look at it on, 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 the, on, on the surface, yes, uh, it makes eminent sense for the Taliban to go after ISIS Khorasan because at the end of the day, uh, they have to seek, at least for the moment, some kind of legitimacy in the eyes of the international community uh, and the ISIS is hell-bent on denying them that. So it makes eminent sense for the Taliban to be opposed uh, to giving any kind of or ceding any kind of space uh, to the, to the uh, ISIS. But at the same time, inherent in that choice is, is this contradiction that you're making a distinction, whether it is America or other Western countries, they have to make this distinction, uh, which, is, which is a flawed one in my opinion, between a good Taliban and a bad Taliban, or a good Taliban and a bad ISIS, or a good terrorist and a bad terrorist, because that you know, sort of distinction has almost always in the past landed the West in trouble. Look, Zaka, uh, Zaka, I think uh, we've got to be realistic and step back a little. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, the world's attention and correctly is, is focused on the very dramatic and sad and horrific events at the Kabul airport. But uh, that will fade away, I dare say, within a week or eight days. Then major problems will come up. And differences and priorities will emerge. I would imagine that for the time being, the priority of the Taliban is to establish a central authority. In their scheme of things, I'm not quite sure how high is combating the ISIS as of now. Perhaps the debates that are taking place among them at the moment relate to the kind of governance structures and the inclusion of non-Taliban people and in what positions uh, in the government. And I dare say for the Afghans too, while terrorism is an absolutely major concern and lives lost are lives lost, but for them too, the priority has to be stability and that can only come from an acceptable central authority. So while the Americans are involved in their domestic politics, and this is a domestic policy, politics issue, the visuals that are playing, the attacks that are being made on the Biden administration, for uh, Afghanistan, and I dare say for the region, the more important consideration is what will happen in terms of governance structures in Afghanistan. And uh, that is, I, to my mind, where the attention will focus immediately after the airport quietens down. So uh, let's be clear on, in our mind, sad and horrific as the, as the ISIS attack was, yeah. there have been other sad and horrific attacks, two terrorist attacks. It's just that 
the way the Biden administration has has managed its exit, has damaged its reputation, mm-hmm. uh, an American reputation, uh, in uh, not only in America itself to a large extent, but also in the world, starting with the region. No one expected that the Americans who claim to be efficient and their system has everything going yeah. in terms of equipment and technology would fail to imagine the kind of collapse that took place of the Afghan military forces mm-hmm. and everything that has, has that has followed has played has flowed from that collapse. So these are major issues that need to be addressed. Yes, you've asked me about turf war between ISIS and the Taliban. That uh, flows from actually the turf war between ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Let us not forget the parentage of ISIS. And let us go back to the fundamentals. And what we are seeing in, in Afghanistan right. is is a manifestation of fundamental. So this will play out in Afghanistan between ISIS and Al-Qaeda and uh, the Taliban. And I dare say, after this incident and this terrible event, Mm -hmm. President Biden and his administration will be left with little choice, given the correlation of forces, but to take, quote-unquote, some assistance and rely quote unquote, to some extent on the Taliban because they are on the ground today. Yeah, not, that not just, is a reality. Not just the Taliban. Uh, I, I guess to some extent even Pakistan. And, and here's the hard course, reality, Pakistan. Doctor, Doctor, Doctor. No, no, but of course Pakistan. Yeah. They've always relied on Pakistan. Yeah, and, and therein lies, uh, you know, a, a fundamental problem, Dr. Wail Awad. Uh, because on the one hand, and, and we know that the, the, the fundamental difference between the ISIS Khorasan and the Taliban is for, for the ISIS, it's more a, a puritanical version. The, the means don't justify the end. The only thing that justifies the end is the end in itself. And the end for them is the establishment of an Islamic caliphate, uh, which is where they differ from the Taliban, uh, who believe in, in negotiations, who believe in, uh, in, in you know, running a regime in Afghanistan, who are looking for international legitimacy, what have you. But here's the problem. All of this, the strings of all of this, are being pulled in Pakistan. And somehow, uh, for at least the last five U.S. presidents that I can think of, they have not pushed Pakistan beyond the cliff, as it were, uh, in in these linkages. Whether it is questioning the ISI, whether it is questioning the Pakistan military, it has somehow been that let's not push them too far, lest the whole thing just collapses. Why is that? And unless you confront that question, you are not going to resolve uh, Afghanistan's future. You're absolutely right, because here you see Americans have to choose between two devils, and they will choose definitely the lesser devil. That's why now they're focusing more on help and getting the help from the Taliban, whom they have removed them from power 20 years ago. And now the focus will be more in the northern part of Afghanistan, northern Waziristan, where all these hub centers for Haqqani network, and also where all the terrorist organizations have taken place there, because most of the uh, the uh, Khorasan... Uh, the, Daesh organization, basically, they are non-Afghani, by the way. And those non-Afghanis are Uyghur, are Turkey, Turkestan, they are also Saudis, they are Pakistanis, they are Kuwaitis, and also name them, and they are everybody, Iraqis, even among them. So, Uzbek, Chechenian. So, all these terrorist organizations now will be giving an American an, op- an opportunity to attack within Pakistan. Because if you remember, Zakka, the United States was very selective in fighting terrorists. It usually only focused on Haqqani network, but they have forgotten the rest of the terrorist organization. So therefore, they used to put pressure on Pakistan, but they always, whenever we confront the American or our friends in the media, they will tell you if Pakistan is a partner with the United States. So if this is a partner, that means it has a role to play, even with the current second phase of American intervention in South Asia. So okay. therefore, I think there is a role to be played for Pakistan, for the American. But nevertheless, the American will find target within Pakistan as a revenge against this heinous attack on our Afghani people. And where the Taliban trying to distance themselves from the uh, terrorist organization, from Al-Qaeda, it's also a clear indication 
from the statement they were giving recently that they had nothing to do with the, uh, with the bombing of 11 September. So this is a clear indication that the Khorasan terrorist organization are not happy with the Taliban. So the United States now definitely going to cooperate with the Taliban because they've chosen the lesser devil. Okay, so uh, again, uh, I reiterate there is a, 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 an inherent problem in, in choosing the lesser devil because then you're instinctly make, making the distinction of good terrorists and bad terrorists and that was al that's always a false choice. But I want to come back to Ravi and ask him about about the Biden presidency and whether, I mean, it's seven months, it's just seven months into his presidency, he's got another three years plus to go. Uh, so much more can happen in the next three years plus. Uh, but, but here's the thing. Uh, it is the old saying, right, that, that for a Democrat, Democrat president, uh, the weight of history, particularly when it comes to national security issues, is far more than it would be for a Republican president. Uh, if you go back to the Vietnam War, even though, uh, you know, Nixon was as much affected by it as his two predecessors were, JFK and, and Lyndon Johnson. It's always associated with their legacies way more than it is with Nixon. After all, it's not the war that brought down Nixon. It was Watergate. Uh, can Biden, you know, counter what is, what is expected to be the easiest, you know, trick in the playbook for the, for the Republican Party, the opposition there? That is, here's a Democrat president who's soft on national security. 13 American lives have been lost. Yeah, that's going to be the tough bit. And so when I mentioned earlier that the, the GOP is already planning to call this a, a Benghazi moment, in other words, you know, a Fox driven talking point uh, that they will use in the next uh, 18 months uh, into the midterm elections, into the presidential elections in 2024. I mean it, this, this is going to be something that they will come back to remind Biden of again and again and again. I think that the challenge for uh, the Biden administration is to remind the American people um, that net net getting out was what they wanted all along and that what Biden is doing is executing the wishes of the American people, um, which is to not be involved in forever wars. I cannot emphasize enough how much the tide has turned in America in terms of public appetite, um, just not being in favor of, of involvement in wars overseas. Uh, this is a generational thing. Um, it is something that has come from more than 20 years of failures around the world. And I'd also like to remind our viewers that, you know, for all the comparisons with Vietnam, and indeed other U.S. failures, uh, be it Iraq, be it Somalia, be it Iran with the fall of the Shah. Uh, there have been many U.S. failures in terms of foreign policy. But the broader trend actually never changed with any of those things. I mean, yes, each of those moments could be seen as sort of stop points along this long road to American decline. But we're still on that very long road. Um, and, you know, in a sense, this actually isn't that surprising. I mean, I think the way in which it was handled is surprising mm -hmm. but the fact that america has pulled out is not this was long telegraphed um, and even european allies admit as much so domestically i think much of it is going to be a spin game uh, between the biden administration and gop operatives and this is going to play out for many many months to come okay. it isn't over much as though we want to put a pin in thursday's attack and only analyze that a lot still depends in the days and weeks ahead. And those things will be uh, how the United States is able to get the other Americans who are still there out safely, how it is able to help uh, Afghan refugees resettle around the world, how it is able to funnel aid to Afghanis, I say, to, to Afghans, uh, not to the Taliban necessarily, but how it is able to keep the Afghan economy running. Mm -hmm. By some estimates, 43 to 50 percent of the Afghan economy depends on foreign aid. All of those things, I think, will be tests of not only the United States, but also the okay. international community, the IMF, the World Bank. Uh, and I think that's where Biden will try to focus his energies in the coming days and weeks. I, I'll give Mr. Sufizada the last word because, you know, the, the irony is this, that at least the world got to know of yesterday's attack. If this attack were to happen post the 31st of August, I don't even know if we would get to know of the extent of, uh, of the damage caused because... There's certainly no Western media. There's certainly no Western presence. And the Taliban would do everything uh, in its powers to try and hush up if something like this, God forbid, were to happen again post the 31st of August. Well, uh, Taliban cannot function unless they are, there's an inclusive government. We need all parties to be there, like Tajiks, like Hazaras, like in, in Pashtuns. So this is a form of government Taliban should look like. 
if they are now to run the government, so it needs resources, it needs man manpower, and it mean it mean it mean youth participation. It mean it mean it requires the women participation, and those are some of the things that I th I think the uh, Taliban should consider in order to be recognized in the All international right. platform, right. and w which is missing right now. And I've, of course, Afghanistan Afghans will stay in Afghanistan only if they are given the right environment to stay sure. and to work. All right, uh, Mr. Sufi Zada, Ravi Agarwal, uh, Mr. Kaju, and uh, Dr. Awad, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, like I said at the top of the show, uh, it is really up to the Biden presidency to see how it can salvage itself from this current mess. Yes, up until yesterday, they could get away with the fact that, you know, this is what a majority of Americans wanted. They wanted a close to the war. Yes, you can quibble about the manner of the exit. The exit was botched up, so on and so forth. But after the loss of American lives, uh, Biden needs to be not just doing, but to be seen to be doing something to go after those folks. And, in, and therein uh, will lie whether he can salvage uh, the rest of his presidency or not. That's a wrap. I'll catch you again Monday night, same time. Thanks for your time. Enjoy your weekend.